In the early hours of May 25th, 1944, hundreds of Waffen-SS paratroopers dropped into Josip Broz Tito's headquarters with the support of Luftwaffe airstrikes. The swift coup de main attack was part of the larger Operation Rosselsprung, with the objective to capture or get rid of the communist leader once and for all. As World War II raged on, Tito had formed a guerrilla force of 200,000 men to fight off the German occupation of Yugoslavia. He had become a real threat to the German order, and Hitler was enraged, ordering a mission that would finish the Yugoslav revolutionary. Still, to get close to Tito, the paratroopers would first need to engage his entire forces, armed to the teeth with Italian weapons and ready to fight to the last man. A Partisan Leader On April 6, 1941, the Axis forces invaded and surrounded Yugoslavia, overwhelming the National Army and forcing it to surrender ten days later. The country was then divided between the victors, with the Vienna Line separating the northern territories that belonged to the Reich and the southern lands occupied by the Italians. However, after Italy's withdrawal, armed guerrilla groups took over the spoils left behind when the country collapsed. One such group was the Yugoslav Partisans, or the National Liberation Army, led by Communist leader Josip Broz Tito and supported by the American, British, and Soviet forces. The other group was the Yugoslav Royalist and Serbian Nationalist guerrilla, also called the Chetniks, partially aligned with Germany and led by Draža Mihailović. Despite the success of the Case White and Case Black Axis offensives of early 1943 to eradicate the Communist Party resistance, Tito only grew stronger after Italy's capitulation. By September, his guerrilla forces amounted to 200,000 men, significantly increasing his influence in the country. In addition, Tito armed his partisans with thousands of weapons that the Italian forces had left behind. The leader named himself Prime Minister and Marshal of Yugoslavia and established his headquarters in Dervar, Bosnia, in the Dinaric Alps. The base was hidden inside a cave, but as his forces grew, it was no longer possible to conceal them. The Unak River passed through the ridgeline where the cave and the outer outposts were located, becoming a natural obstacle against enemy incursions into the partisan territory. Furthermore, American, British, and Soviet military intelligence personnel had also established their operating bases around Dervar. These foreign allied forces supplied the partisans with weapons, ammunition, intelligence, and training, and one of the British officers giving counsel to the partisans was Major Randolph Churchill, son of Winston Churchill. The Germans considered Tito a highly significant obstacle, and even General Field Marshal Maximilian von Weichs, the Wehrmacht's commander of Southeast Europe, wrote that, quote, Tito is our most dangerous enemy. For the Wehrmacht to impose order in the region, Tito had to be taken care of, no matter the cost. Hunting down Tito. German intelligence agencies began gathering information about Tito and his headquarters in late 1943, in preparation for an ambitious secret operation to hunt him down. One of them was the Benesh Special Unit of Section 2 of the Abwehr, which sent agents to the region to find out about partisan activity and organization. As members of the elite Brandenburg Division, these men blended easily with the population, given their ability to speak the local languages, facilitating cooperation with the Chetniks. Front Reconnaissance Troop 216 of the Abwehr also tracked Tito and his forces. However, most of the research came directly from the intelligence branch of the SS, which received direct orders from Waffen SS Major Otto Skorzeny. Hitler had personally designated Skorzeny for the mission, and he did not disappoint. His men obtained enough information from partisan deserters to conclude that Tito's headquarters were in Dervar. Still, Skorzeny would later retract from the operation after rumors circulated about a German plot to assassinate the partisan leader. SS Hauptsturmfuhrer Captain Kurt Ripke, commander of the 500th Waffen SS Parachute Battalion, was then tasked with planning the operation under the codename Rüsselsprung, and Hitler approved it on May 21, 1944. It was decided that several units from the Heer, Waffen SS, and other foreign forces would participate. The main assault on Tito's headquarters would be carried out by both the 15th Mountain Corps under General de Infanterie Ernst von Laser and the 500th Waffen SS paratroopers of Captain Ribke. The first part of the operation called for a heavy aerial bombardment conducted by the Luftwaffe around Dervar and nearby partisan outposts. 
After that, the German paratroopers and glider assault troops from the 500th SS Parachute Battalion would surround Tito's headquarters to decimate his forces, and an FI-156 Stork reconnaissance aircraft would then fly into the location to pick up Tito, regardless of his condition. Secondary objectives included the total or partial destruction of Allied supplies in the region and the capture of as many American, British, and Soviet intelligence officers as possible. Afterward, the Parachute Battalion would link up with the 15th Mountain Corps to mop up the scattered enemy resistance. However, Captain Ripka soon realized that the gliders and transport aircraft available would not be enough to land all his men, and decided to split his force into two waves. The first 300 Germans would assault Tito's headquarters at 7 a.m. on May 25th, while another 300 would secure nearby towns and partisan posts. Each wave was divided into three different groups with closely related objectives that would ultimately link up with the rest of the 15th Mountain Corps. Attack on Javar The partisans knew that the enemy was coming and were aware of the presence of the 500th SS Parachute Battalion and the German garrison, even as the paratroopers had been transported to Najbetskadek dressed in here uniforms. When the partisans spotted them and the respective transport aircraft, they moved Tito's headquarters to another cave near the town of Bastazi. Then, on May 23rd, a German stork spotted the American and British military outposts, but the Allies also saw it and warned Tito of an imminent offensive. Tito and his staff believed such an attack was impossible, as the area was heavily defended and surrounded by thousands of partisans. Dismissing the warning, he stayed at Dervar and celebrated his birthday the following day. At 5 a.m. on May 25th, Five squadrons of Junkers Ju-87 dive bombers started to bomb Dravar, Bosansky, Petrovac, and other surrounding areas. And two hours later, the 500th SS Parachute Battalion members began to glide and parachute into their objectives. The Germans advanced with ruthless efficiency in the middle of the smoke, fire, and crumbling buildings. Armed with SGG-44s and lightweight FG-42s, the paratroopers quickly secured Dravar and avoided enemy resistance. With the support of Panther and Red Groups, Captain Ribka established his headquarters near a cemetery that was close to Tito's base, although the Yugoslav leader and the men from his personal guard were nowhere to be seen. Meanwhile, the Brecker and Greifer groups failed to capture the desired American and British intelligence officers, but were still able to destroy some of the supplies they left behind. Other groups landed near the office of the Communist Party of the Yugoslavia Central Committee, where its defenders resisted until the building was leveled using satchel charges. In another brutal encounter, the Stormer Group engaged Tito's bodyguards in a firefight near one of the exits of the Divar Cave, and by 10 a.m., most of the town was under the control of the paratroopers. Attacking the Caves The Germans began questioning the citizens about Tito's location, but no one dared say where the leader was hiding. Then, 30 minutes later, Captain Ribka rallied his Waffen-SS troops for a frontal attack across the Unak River after sighting the partisans concentrating at the northern portion of the Divar cave. In response, the partisans used the high ground and shot down several seasoned German paratroopers. Still, Captain Ribka managed to take his men to the base of the hill with help from some MG-42s firing directly into some of the cave openings from where the communists were firing. Captured partisans then confirmed that Tito and his staff were hidden inside the cave. Now the 500th and the 15th Mountain Corps needed to surround the cave, but it was not going to be easy. As the minutes passed, the Germans kept losing soldiers while the enemy only grew stronger. More and more partisans kept pouring into Dervar and attacking them from all sides. At around 11.30 a.m., while the Germans were trying to make their way into the cave and prevent the partisan forces from encircling them, Tito and his staff were able to escape from a platform located at the mouth of the cave. The men had to climb down a rope that led them to a creek crossing with the Unak River, and once there, Tito and his staff went east and retreated towards the village of Potoci. Meanwhile, Captain Ribka withdrew his men from the cave and formed a defensive perimeter with the support of the second wave of paratroopers. Still, by 9 p.m., the SS troops had been completely encircled by the partisans. Ribka then evacuated after being wounded by a grenade, and the rest of the paratroopers held the perimeter for almost an entire day until they were relieved by the 92nd Motorized Grenadier Regiment. The mission proved a failure, even as the Germans took the lives of over 9,000 partisans compared to their 400 losses. Still, Tito managed to escape, 
and would eventually serve as the president of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia for 27 years. Thank you for watching my video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And let us know in the comments below what you think of Operation Rüsselsprung. Do you think the Waffen-SS troops had a real chance at capturing Tito and the vast army that protected him? Stay tuned for more.